Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Sustainability and Your Investors. Our speakers today are Knut Hannes, a Senior Partner and Managing Director in BCG's Boston Consulting Group's Geneva office, and until recently, the global leader of BCG's strategy practice area. And Gregory Unruh, the Arison Group Endowed Professor at George Mason University. I'm David Kiron, Executive Editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be both co-speaker and your moderator today. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of the live event. In addition, today's slides will be available to all attendees. We welcome your questions today. To submit questions, please enter them in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMR event. If you are having audio difficulties while listening via computer, please call in via telephone instead. Okay, so much for the housekeeping. This is what we have planned for you today. I'm going to give some background on MIT, SMR, and BCG's uh, research collaboration. I'll then introduce this year's research project. Then Greg and Knut will discuss our key findings in much greater detail, and we will go into a Q&A session at the end. We're very excited to be here today to discuss the seventh annual sustainability report report, jointly produced by BCG and MIT SMR. The aim of doing these reports has been to better understand how sustainability issues are playing out in the corporate context. What are the key opportunities and challenges for companies with respect to sustainability? These are important questions since the private sector has a large role to play in addressing sustainability issues that world leaders, from the Pope to the U.S. President to the head of the United Nations, have identified as among the most urgent and important of our time. Over the years, we've explored the characteristics of companies that have embraced sustainability as part of their corporate strategy. We've examined the business case for sustainability, identified companies that are walking the talk on sustainability, and discussed corporate collaborations that solve business problems using sustainability-oriented approaches. We've surveyed tens of thousands of executives and managers in companies, large and small, from around the world in different industries. In addition to the surveys, each year we conduct interviews with academic experts and industry leaders to deepen our understanding of different sustainability trends that are taking place within the corporate landscape. In this year's research, we focus on investors. Part of the rationale for looking at investors is that corporate executives have a tendency to point to investors as a key stumbling block when it comes to their companies taking action on long-term sustainability issues. It is almost conventional wisdom that investors have a short-term focus and that corporate leaders tend to develop strategies to please their shareholders, or at least what they perceive would please their investors. So the accuracy of leadership's perceptions about shareholders matter a great deal. So we asked investors themselves what they think about the importance of sustainability performance to their investment decisions and analyzed whether their attitudes and behaviors matched up with executive attitudes about investors. On this slide, you can see that we had responses from 3,000 managers, many with senior roles in their organizations. Most of the respondents come from MIT SMR subscribers. More than 500 of the 3,000 respondents were investors. As the report discusses, many of these investors describe their companies as being strategic, institutional, retail types of investors. The key question we looked at is, how is executive decision-making influenced by investor perceptions about sustainability? Do executives know what investors want? And the answer is, many executives do appreciate that investors have an interest in a company's performance on environmental, social, and governance metrics but there's a sizable gap between the numbers of executives who believe that investors care about sustainability and the numbers of investors who say they care about sustainability. Investors care more about sustainability than many executives think. And the key survey finding that we have is that three out of four executives in investment firms agree that a company's good sustainability performance matters a great deal to them when making investment decisions. And Greg is going to explain a bit more about what that means in a moment. But just three out of five executives in publicly traded companies believe that good sustainability performance is materially important to investors. 
three out of four versus three out of five. This is a substantial gap between what executives believe about investors and what investors themselves believe. This is why we say investors care more about sustainability than many executives think. In addition, bad sustainability performance matters a great deal to investment firms' top leadership. They will change their behavior based on uh, uh, what they see uh, companies doing. So with that, we're going to move to uh, Greg, who's going to dive uh, more into the details of the research. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, so all of the sustainability professionals listening out there are familiar with this historic refrain you would get from your chief financial officer. Uh, corporate financial managers would always say when talking about sustainability, all of this stuff is great, all of the sustainability initiatives are fine, but investors don't care about it. Uh, investors only care about next quarter's results. And that would stop the sustainability discussion in its tracks because there really was no good response to this perception of short-term inv investor concerns. Sustainability, by definition, is concerned with the long term. And building sustainability value occurs by building an impact and a reputation over time. So that the uh, perception that investors didn't care was a huge barrier to financing and moving forward on sustainability initiatives. And that's why the results of this year's survey are so important. Investors in our survey, as you heard, have reported that overwhelmingly they care about sustainability performance. Uh, nearly three-quarters say sustainability is material important to their investment decisions, which is big news. And, that's, uh, and it's not some fringe attitude we found in, the, in these investment houses. It starts at the very top. Uh, over 80% of directors and three-quarters of CEOs and C-suite executives say sustainability is something that needs to be accounted for in portfolio investment decisions. So this is uh, this is points to the, the the high level of importance that sustainability issues are beginning to take uh, in the in these institutions. And so the perception that investors don't care about sustainability is really out of date. And this is going to have implications for companies and corporate managers and something they're going to need to begin to take account of as moving forward. And as David mentioned, uh, the most immediate impact we're beginning to see already is that investors say they will divest or exclude companies with poor sustainability performance. Now, that's not just some kind of idle threat. We are actually beginning to see investors already doing this. And uh, one of the sectors where this is happening the fastest and with the biggest impact is in the area of the fossil fuel uh, sectors, both oil and gas and coal. Um, in, there is a broad range of investors that are already in the process of divesting over $2 trillion in fossil fuel assets. That's trillion with a T. So that is clearly a material impact. And given the uh, trends we've seen in international policy, especially the, the Paris Climate Agreements, uh, in December, the expectation that is that investor pressure in these areas and on this sector will only rise. In, in fact, just yesterday, uh, ExxonMobil had its annual general meeting, and the company faced 11 different shareholder resolu resolutions that were calling on Exxon to account for the impact of climate change on its business. And this is an important one to watch because the company's board and executives have been resisting efforts to get the company to annually assess climate uh, as a shareholder concern. And what's really important is that shareholders approved one of those re resolutions yesterday, which has opened the way now for the possibility of having a climate expert on Exxon's board. So these are important trends, and you can see that investors can have a powerful influence um, on companies in terms of their attitudes towards sustainability and how they have to incorporate it into their strategic thinking. Um, and the fossil fuel sector may just be the canary in the coal mine, and we may begin to see this uh, trend expanding uh, systematically to other industries and sectors. But it's not just negatively screening out or excluding poor sustainability performers in sectors. What I think is more interesting is we're beginning to see the use of performance, sustainability performance data to proactively and positively select companies that are likely to grow and benefit from a, uh, a more sustainable future that uh, the, the world is moving into. And a recent high-profile example of this approach is generation investments. You know, um, Al Gore didn't invent the Internet, 
but he and his partner, David Blood, appear to have in invented a pretty reliable way to profit from sustainability. Um, their company, Generation Investments, was built on this assertion that incorporating ESG indicators, environmental, social, and governance, or sustainability indicators, uh, gives a bigger and better picture of a company's future financial prospects. And this year, Generation uh, uh, participated in a study uh, that showed that their approach uh, is, in fact, doing well by doing good. The data shows that out of the top 200 global equity management houses over a decade, Generation Investment ranked number two, all right? And they have had very high uh, returns. They've averaged uh, more than 12% a year through this chaotic boom and bust uh, economic uh, global economic cycles we've been seeing, and they've consistently been beating market indices. Now, you, there have been impact investors and socially responsible investors active in the space for some time, but Generation's example has highlighted this mainstreaming uh, of the understanding of the value of sustainability uh, as an information source in making, in, in making investment decisions. A generation credits their success to the broader investment perspective that ES and G data provides. And really the logic behind this is pretty simple. Better data means better informed decisions. And this is one of the things we're seeing with these investors. They have access now to more and better ES and G data, and they are now developing better algorithms, better models, and better methods to incorporate that, that data and evaluate their importance for their ongoing investments decisions. So we're seeing the shift towards a mature and a more sustainability-savvy investor base that understands um, how to use sustainability data. And uh, what we're seeing is also a shift away from more older traditional pr approaches or ways we uh, try to e evaluate sustainability performance to more precise uh, approaches. And it's leaving some of these older approaches in the, in the, in the dust. And um, one of these approaches are the sustainability indices, sustainability rankings, like Dow Jones Sustainability Index or the FTSE for Good. Um, our surveys indicated that investors don't find these uh, indices or these rankings uh, very helpful for investment decision making. Only a third of the investors we surveyed said they actually consider them at all in their uh, investment decision. And it's not limited just to the investment houses. We see similar skepticism in our survey among company managers. Uh, these are the company managers that have to collect the data and, and provide them so that they can actually be listed on these rankings. Um, and they, the, the, the attitude we got, both through the survey and the, in the interviews, is that companies are going through the motions. This is a pro forma thing that they're doing, but nobody seems to uh, recognize very much value being created uh, through that process. And you know, some of the recent corporate sustainability disasters can indicate or help us understand why there might be um, skepticism towards ratings in some of these more traditional or earlier approaches. We've discovered this decade that managing sustainability can be incredibly costly for a company. Uh, mismanaging the environmental issues around deep water oil production has cost BP, by some estimates, $54 billion. And we don't know. We still have to wait to see how much VW's mismanagement of its environmental emissions concerns is going to cost the company. However, what's, it, what's important to notice is that prior to those disasters, both BP and VW were highly ranked in sustainability indices and, in, in, indices and ratings. Yet this ranking gave no information to investors, for example, about the risks that diesel engines could pose uh, for VW's sustainability performance going forward. Now, we also, though, interviewed investors uh, that said they used sustainability information uh, proactively to evaluate the sustainability risks being faced by uh, both BP and VW. Uh, and they were used that insight then to get out of those stocks before the disasters and the massive hit to shares actually came. And you can read more about this in the report if that's interesting to you. But in terms of the indices and ratings, it was only after the disasters that these companies were actually then removed from the listings. So the indices seem to be a trailing, not a lead indicator of sustainability performance. And... Um, Indices, you know, smart investors are looking elsewhere for their sustainability performance data. And this is going to be an important question going forward. Where is that information going to be coming from? Is it going to be coming from companies or is it going to be coming from somewhere else? And can companies successfully communicate the sustainability value their initiatives are creating? Can they create that in a compelling way to investors? 
and this was a large open question that came out of our research, and it may be one that uh, Knut might touch on as he talks about some of the other interesting findings we came, uh, we discovered during this uh, process. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. So, so you talked uh, a little bit about the fact that uh, investors care, actually care more than executives, broadly speaking, are aware of, and uh, large part of why investors care is, of course, that there are risks involved, and you showed a couple of examples. The flip side of the coin on risk is uh, is revenue growth opportunities, and we see that too. I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, over the last couple of years, and we've been tracking this now for some time, uh, we start seeing real revenue growth in the area of sustainability. So the, the mega trend is not only a trend in terms of uh, addressing risks, it's also a trend in terms of seeing and driving the upside uh, of, uh, of sustainability. So on, on the slide, we point to some of what we call the green giants, so companies that actually have been able to generate substantial revenue with sustainability products or services. I'll talk about services afterwards. With high uh, profitability. And you see a few, few examples there, but there are many. And I think the uh, main message is uh, we will see more and more. And how do they do it? I mean, we will talk a little bit towards the end about kind of what are learnings for companies, etc. But but I think there are three steps we just want to highlight here and now. One is uh, one which we've talked about over the years, which is the commi commitment from the top. Uh, the commitment from the CEO is, in all the cases we see, necessary. It's usually a top-down, bottom-up kind of process, but the top-down is critically important. And... We're here saying the CEO, but I think in addition to the CEO, we should also say the board. Because uh, in our 2014 study, David, we looked at the role of the board, and uh, it's critical. Uh, what we actually found is boards uh, care about sustainability, but they don't as often give good guidance to the executives when it comes to, to, uh, to uh, sustainability. So that's one. Second one is... Uh, uh, in many areas, uh, we will see opportunities through disruptions when it comes to sustainability. New technologies, new business models, new ways of doing things, uh, local ways, ways of building new value chains, etc. So what we see is that the companies that actually make this happen, they uh, are not afraid of disruptive innovations. They actually embrace them as well, and they're willing to look for, for entirely new solutions. And then thirdly, really important uh, this does happen with close with the with the the key customers so it can't only be a a very niche kind of thing it needs to be something that aims for mass markets but we really see that uh, also now in in entirely new areas uh, i i think uh, uh food is one example where we see sort of a global explosion in the in the area of natural, organics, etc. So as an example of uh, mainstreaming and really building sustainability growth with, with the customers. So we're seeing the upside as well, and we see that uh, investors care both about the risks, very important, but also on, on the upside. Uh, let me share a couple of data points, uh, over-the-time data points, and we've asked some questions, uh, and we'll talk about a couple of them, over the years. So six time data points on, on the question of, is a sustainability strategy necessary to be competitive? And what I'd say about that is uh, a, a majority says yes. A sustainability strategy is necessary, and this is relatively stable. Around 60%, uh, I, I think there has been some ups and downs, but, but it's very much around 60% and another sort of 20% plus saying if it isn't com necessary to be competitive today, it will be tomorrow. So there's a, a broad understanding and it's robust, it's stable, we see it over time on the question of the necessity of really addressing sustainability. That being said, I think a lot of companies are confused and feel a little bit uh, humbled by how to address it uh, because it can be uh, uh, somewhat daunting and often a little bit too complex. 
And that really plays to the next slide, which I think is a little bit the essence of the sustainability challenge. Uh, there is actually a discrepancy between intentions and reality. 90% of all companies, just about, consider a sustainability strategy as important. 90%, so most companies. 60% say that they incorporate sustainability into their strategy, so into their prioritizations, resource allocation, overtime planning, etc. But only a quarter say that they have a business case for sustainability. And on this point, I think uh, uh, what we see is that co companies over time probably become more capable of building the business case, but they also become more humble in terms of saying that they do. And this, I think, is a little bit the essence of uh, sustainability. We, we want to drive sustainability challenges. We see the importance of it, but many companies uh, still struggle with how to make it tangible, how to really uh, show the value proofs, how to really document uh, the value creation, etc. But we're seeing great examples. Uh, we're seeing great success stories. And we're also starting to see pretty good documentation that companies that really drive, success, drive sustainability strategies are actually, on the whole, more successful financially as well. I think this is, uh, this is an area that uh, is opening up. We're starting to see... We will see it more clearly over time, but I think the window is, is now open. Uh, let, let's move a little bit ahead and, and look at another over-the-time uh, uh, point that we've mentioned and that I want to talk a little bit about. This is the value proposition. And, and I think, um, in a way, I think uh, we have a huge job to do here to, to clarify the value proposition of sustainability. When we listen to investors, and of course that's what we've done this year round, uh, investors are very clear on one thing. There is risk associated with poor sustainability strategies. We want to stay away from that risk. We're even willing to exit. So that's one very tangible area of value propositions. The other area is, of course, the area of uh, uh, competitive advantage, growth into new areas, etc. And here we see a lot of companies struggling. But we see it as critically important, and, and we see good examples. But I, I, I would say that, as I mentioned, um, go, <laughs> backtracking five, six years, more companies said that they had the business case nailed down than today. I think it's a reflection of uh, a little bit the modesty of actually trying to make it happen. A quarter does, and I think that quarter is probably a, a one that's been building uh, experience over the last five, ten, ten years. Okay, business models. And uh, we did have a, a report out on that four years ago on the link between sustainability and business model changes. It's really interesting and uh, one of the most important areas of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the future sustainability economy. And, and I, I'd say two things. We see huge changes in business models, particularly as companies drive sustainability aggressively. Uh, we see things like uh, from selling uh, energy to se selling energy efficiency, so taking on a much more managed service solution. And we see lots of, I mean, lots of great examples related to putting on the lens of the circular economy, where you take a, a more holistic perspective, you look at recycling opportunities, you look at opportunities of uh, collaborating much more closely in, in the value chain or in, in the system that you work within. So I think this whole issue of sustainability and business model change is one which is, uh, again, very important and, uh, and one to watch out for. I think uh, ambitious sustainability strategies will uh, require in many cases that we are actually open to, to changing and adapting our business models. Next page, uh, just an example. I think the, we could mention lots of examples and we could uh, uh, mention other examples, of course, but I think this is a nice one where uh, we just see tangible evidence that investors in so many cases are willing to pay a premium. So it's not only about kind of, you know, uh, staying away from the risks, 
but it's also investing into good practices. And, and the example here is, uh, uh, you know, big multinational, uh, Japan-based multinational acquiring a commodity trader and openly in the media saying that we're paying a premium and, and the premium is really related to the security of, uh, of uh, palm oil sourcing, organic palm oil sourcing, which is... Uh, which is important, and uh, it's it's an area where you actually can build a real competitive edge that others can't really replicate fast, which is also, of course, the reason for a premium. So I think there is there is uh, more and more stories to illustrate the the you know the the investor perspective. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the communication around the sustainability and and. Uh, one thing we see, and I think we've seen that over time as well, but this year more closely, is that um, uh, sustainability ambitions don't necessarily translate down to to, uh, to the whole organization. We do see that it actually trickles down more effectively in investment firms than in large corporations. In part, that's, uh, that's because these are tighter ships and often smaller ships as well. But I think in part it's also because there's a, a, maybe a more shared understanding of which few things are we really looking at when it comes to sustainability. What do we want to avoid? And I would say also as a kind of a, a management consulting working across industries, uh, the whole art of due diligence in many cases has changed from not really looking for sustainability risks in the past to today being much more aware of risks related to labor practices, to environmental footprint, to uh, uh, license to operate kind of uh, uh, challenges, etc. So, so I think on the investor side, there is a trickle down, and it's stronger than uh, everything else equal in large corporations, where this is a big challenge. There is a challenge of actually embedding sustainability ambitions into strategies and making them come alive in the whole organization. There's no hiding. This is really a, a case. And on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, just quick observation around uh, investor relations professionals. Uh, they don't talk much about sustainability. They are not asked to talk about it. It's not something that comes up. But I do think that uh, this year's study probably sends a signal that uh, uh, this is something that should be addressed simply because investors actually care about it. Uh, uh, they will care less about the kind of fluffy ambition statements, but they will care very much about the risks and the growth opportunities having been achieved and the, the opportunities uh, for, for profitable growth going forward. So that's a little bit uh, over time picture as well. Uh, there is, of course, more, but, but I think... Um, I feel that there are two things we, we kind of see in the overtime picture. Uh, we see that the com commitment is robust. We see patterns that are clear. And then I think we see uh, uh, more clarity among a certain amount of companies that actually build real business cases, build uh, competitive advantages, and that build uh, uh, growth opportunities in the area of sustainability. And, uh, and uh, if I move that to the to the next slide, just a couple of observations around, you know, what what does this year's study uh, mean for for companies? And the uh, first observation would be to say that uh, executives, CEOs should not underestimate the importance of sustainability to investors. It is actually important, and investors are more aware, and they're care more about the, the underlying risks because they see them, they're transparent, uh, there are big cases out there that actually, as we've shown a couple of examples of, have huge uh, uh, consequences. So let's not underestimate the importance. That's one. Second one is a little bit more on kind of building the sustainability strategy. And before I go into the points, I just want to make one observation, which I think is important for all companies. I think it's really important to distinguish compliance. What do we do to comply? 
and competitive advantage? In which few areas do we want to build competitive advantage? Compliance and competitive advantage are not the same, and they shouldn't be addressed in the same way. And in many cases, we see that they're, they're I would say, mixed up a bit. And, and uh, clarity on compliance and competitive advantage is, is certainly important. So a couple of steps that we feel are important, also based on, on this year's and prior studies. So building awareness, which is really what we are trying to do with the, with this data and with the overtime series as well. Secondly, be very clear on what the material issues are. Companies that are actually able to define and address and drive towards material issues do better. And it's very well documented in uh, research and and you know in in case case examples etc drive to material issues and be very precise on which issues really matter for us our survival as a company and then thirdly be very focused on the tangible measurable outcomes and that brings us back to the business case this takes off when we can document and be very specific around it, when it's fussy and more as a declaration. It doesn't really mobilize uh, uh, employees, but it doesn't really mobilize uh, investors either. Translate this into a sustainability strategy. Be open to the fact that there uh, uh, needs to be a, a value proof, and we've talked about that. And last point, Engage investors. Engage investors in, in the sustainability strategy discussions. I think uh, they're open to it, but that kind of requires the points above that we're actually able to talk about the material issues, that we're able to talk about the business case, that we're able to talk about measurable outcomes, and that there's you know a link between sustainability compliance and competitive advantage and I think that really needs to be very clear so that's a bit the recommendations for companies and David you will take us a little bit into the the investor perspective as well before we open up thank you thank you Knut that's exactly right thank you Greg and Knut for uh, your discussion of the key uh, uh, findings from the report in addition to the uh, discussion about our recommendations for companies uh, the final slide in the presentation before moving on to the uh, Q&A part is, rec is recommendations for um, uh, recommendations for the um, investors. So, um, next slide. So, we have a we have a few recommendations for investors, and they all center around uh, a, a, a few. Key points. Um, this first bullet uh, clearly short-term investment strategies uh, can have a place in an investment portfolio, but there are clear signs that uh, mid to long-term investment strategies that consider the factor in uh, corporate performance on sustainability issues uh, can carry less risk in some instances and uh, can outperform uh, mainstream indices. Um, so. Uh, uh, but in order to identify, uh, you know, what can be uh, solid um, mid to long term investment strategies, uh, you need to recognize that there's a suite of tools that now exist uh, and that are actually building that recognize how non-financial information can be material to a company's prospects. Um, there's a there's a there's a growing number of resources, uh, both in terms of tools, people, organizations that can identify what that information is and talk about how to use it. Uh, those are the next uh, two, uh, the second and third bullets. Um, you don't have to develop your own uh, valuation methods to account for non-financial non uh, uh, sustainability issues, but uh, these things exist outside, and what we're finding is that in lieu of the um, in lieu of there being a great uh, many of, of these resources, uh, some companies, some investment firms are developing their own. Um, uh, the next slide, the next bullet, avoid relying on sustainability indices, indices which can be misleading. Uh, I mean, who doesn't like the comfort of investing in a top-ranked company? 
Um, but not all rankings are considered uh, are, are equal. Um, with many rankings based on subjective information self-reported by the companies, these may not be a reliable source of inve investment information. Um, uh, don't don't be misled by the uh, uh, by the bright stars at the top of rankings. Um, uh, VW that Greg mentioned is a, is a is a prime example. Um, and the last bullet, uh, actively engage in discussions on sustainability topics with companies, um, which is the uh, in inverse of uh, the last point that Knut has uh, made, uh, engage where he was talking about executives engaging investors. Here we're talking about investors engaging with uh, companies in different ways. Um, if companies don't know th that you as an investor care, they'll assume you don't. Uh, that's been the status quo for some time. Uh, we did a survey with the National Institute of uh, in, in Investor Relations Professionals uh, that looked at uh, what investor relations professionals were seeing in the uh, marketplace in terms of the dialogue between uh, what uh, their companies were representing about uh, sustainability and what people in the market, in the, in, the, in the investor marketplace, were looking for in terms of information about their company's sustainability performance. And they saw a big disconnect. And uh, their, their, uh, what we heard from uh, the investor relations professionals is that they are, they're waiting for questions uh, and they're perfectly happy to uh, ignore uh, folks who are not asking um, questions about sustainability because in large part their companies don't have a story to tell about sustainability. So that concludes our uh, our the session on the presentation. We're going to move into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, we've gotten lots of great questions, and we'll continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour. A reminder that you can submit your questions by entering them into the chat box in the lower left corner of the webinar screen or on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREvent. And we've got, uh, since I was just speaking to that slide, we've just had a tremendous number of uh, questions come through. Um, I'm going to start us off with uh, one question uh, to Greg, who we have not heard from in a little while, uh, while I sort through some of these questions. Greg, w one, of these, uh, one of these questions was, was asking about wage inequality within a company. Do investors recognize this as a sustainability issue? How would you answer that? Right. Well, uh, first of all, I would say that was not something we explicitly uh, sought to learn from our, our survey here. Um, and it's not something that came up in the specific interviews we did uh, for this report. That said, there are a broad number of issues that um, fall under the, this growing umbrella of what I includes sustainability and um, governance, you know, clearly governance, both internal governance uh, within the organization and the relationship to a, co a, a company to, say, political governance, these are all uh, sort of emerging sustainability issues. They're, 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 they're not necessarily fringe, but they're not universally recognized by all companies and most stakeholders as sustainability concerns. In, um, salary or income inequality within the organization is important to uh, uh, um, some stakeholder groups, and they are be, beginning to be effective at bringing attention to that problem, uh, both to the public and to uh, company executives. A lot of the attention is on executive pay, uh, as we've seen, and that is a, a concern that's being brought by investors to um, to the board and and to annual meetings by um, through uh, resolutions and proxy uh, proxy initiatives. Uh, so that that is a that is a concern. Um, it's not one that we can specifically address from the from our current survey, but it, it is one of these issues that has fallen under the the umbrella of sustainability, and increasingly uh, companies need systems to identify and be aware of these what seem like peripheral issues and be able to quickly evaluate uh, is that an issue that's going to that's going to impact us 
is that an issue, is that an area where our organization face potential risks if we become, if we get uh, stakeholder attention to the way we're managing it? And also, is there an opportunity for us uh, to, different, in a differentiated way, take action on this issue such that it uh, helps maybe uh, drive some kind of um, resolution to the problem, but also then uh, enhances or improves um, uh, our business value creation as well. So that's the way I would uh, I would look at that. I would look at these more broadly, that there will be lots of issues sector by sector, industry by industry, that emerge that um, sort of fringe stakeholders are paying attention to and what we what we think what we see and what we think is necessary is that companies develop systems to quickly evaluate and determine uh, how material those issues are going to be for our organization and uh, how much managerial attention should we pay to them and does it require then uh, the innovation uh, or business model change that Knut was discussing earlier? That's great. And 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 Knut, do you? Another another question uh, uh, that, that seems right up your alley uh, is, involves C-suites and boards. Uh, do you see uh, C-suites, uh, 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 members of the C-suite CEOs, with a desire to bring boards into the sustainability uh, conversation? Absolutely. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we did this uh, – uh, uh, report two years ago with the UN Global Compact. Uh, we looked at the role of boards. Uh, I think uh, almost 90% of uh, executives surveyed argued that uh, board commitment is important to drive successful sustainability strategies. So almost 90%. But only 45% just about said that uh, the board guidance and support is satisfactory. So there's a huge gap between the need for board support and the guidance and the support actually being given by board. So I think this is a big area. Executives need it, uh, and they need it not only in terms of uh, uh, you know the, the commitment to sustainability in broad terms. They also need it for very specific uh, purposes, uh, one such specific purpose is the whole area of collaboration. Uh, increasingly, winning in sustainability is a team sport. You can't, as a company, do it alone. You need to partner up. Partnering up is difficult for many reasons. Uh, you need the experience, you need the access, you need the ability to prioritize, etc. And in this area, I would say that boards can be and can play a very important role. So I'm I'm a, I'm a big big one when it comes to the role of boards, and there's much more that can be done, and we uncovered that a couple of years ago. I think there's a lot that can be done and should be done, and I think now we open a new door. That's the investor side, and and I think opening these kind of doors is important because it builds better overall understanding of how to be successful in a very difficult, very broad and very complicated area. Greg, do you see the uh, uh, the, the low? How would you interpret the the low numbers that uh, Knut just mentioned regarding uh, boards uh, board engagement? The forty five percent number. Uh, what is? Would you say that has more to do with attitudes or skills? Uh, a lack of attitudes, a lack of interest, or a lack of skills, or something else? Um, I, I kind of uh, partially both. I mean, we are. If you look at um, board members, we are. You know, we're facing a generational tr uh, change. I don't have the exact data, but a lot of board members um, are older. They develop their business know-how and their business success in in a time before sustainability was as uh, as recognized and important as it is now. So there is, an, there is a knowledge gap or a, 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 and an understanding gap, and there has been efforts um, to create and provide um, educational opportunities, training programs for board members to help them better understand and manage uh, the, the implications of social and environmental trends uh, on the companies uh, that they're advising or that they're, uh, they're sitting on the board for. Um, so there's, there's a 
so there's a sort of attitudinal problem, or or I shouldn't say problem, but an issue that um, you know many of these you have to be a pretty senior person usually to get on the board, and that means uh, you grew up in, in your in your company before sustainability was a major issue, and then um, you know many our my impression in in working uh, on the board issue is most people on uh, on boards are not that open to um, uh, to, to developing new knowledge and new skills. They, they've been very successful um, and they feel that they're in that position because they know they know as much or more than anyone else. And so there's a little bit of a resistance as well to uh, dip into the world of sustainability that seems awfully foreign and often, often peripheral to what you've seen as important as bi- in, in business. So I, I think the n- numbers re- uh, reflect something about the population uh, of most established board members today or over the last, um, you know, last 10 years or so. And I get a sense, you know, we haven't done the, the, the research, but I get a sense we are shifting. There is a generational shift that will be occurring in boards going forward uh, that we will begin to populate boards with people that are more knowledgeable and perhaps sensitive to these concerns than have been previously. And I, I would just add one thing, Greg. Uh, I agree to what you're saying. Uh, but I, there's nothing that uh, actually drives a proactive stance on sustainability more than a crisis. And many of the companies that today have the best practices have been through a crisis, whether it's the, the Nikes, the Apples, the H&Ms. You know, there are lots of examples. I've seen lots of them personally as well. And... and uh, uh, and a crisis actually is an ad hoc thing. It needs to be dealt with. It's often dealt with well, and it often builds an appetite to be long term and proactive and and deal with this strategically as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, here's another question: uh, At what point can divestment be impactful when there are always investors who will purchase dumped shares? Any sell-off has only a temporary impact. Uh, uh, Knut or Greg? Uh, Why don't you start it, Greg, and maybe I can yeah. add to it. So, um, you know, there is, that, that is true. Um, now, the, the question is uh, how big... Um, how big of a popula- population shift are we are we seeing in terms of investors? And it, it, it's true there will um, there will always be um, traders, uh, short term traders, and that uh, take advantage of, of these types of moves. And the question is, are these sectoral shifts in in investor interest going to have an implication? Um, you know, it's it's we're still we're not at a point where um, there are established sort of investment products, large investment products that say a pension fund or, um, you know, a mutual fund, they're they're not that, we don't have those scale products yet that incorporate sustainability um, information, sustainability ESG data into the the, the stock process. As that occurs, though, um, you will see, it'll be, you will see, I think you'll be able to see, and and as that, and as that uh, approach uh, begins to prove itself increasingly over time. I mean, we have now over a decade's worth of data, in, in, including, you know, what we talked about the generation investment uh, case example, but there's plenty of academic research uh, over the years that has showed uh, incorporating sustainability considerations into your portfolio selection uh, doesn't uh, doesn't reduce your returns. Uh, at the very, you know, at the very least, it it it, it it's neutral, um, and then uh, a, a big majority of the, the studies show that uh, incorporating sustainability in your, your investment strategy actually enhances returns. And if that's the case, then you'll see more and more investors shifting towards that. Um, that will also have the knock-on effect of influencing more companies to include sustainability into their strategy and into their uh, business model uh, shifts. And so, uh, you know, I think what we'll see is there will still be investors that will, you know, that are not concerned about sustainability. But as incorporating the S&G proves itself, you'll see more and more investors shift towards that. Uh, and you'll see um, major, I mean, you can imagine, just imagine the, the impact 
you know, so Walmart, when it decided that it was going to evaluate companies, um, the sustainability performance of their products as a criteria for deciding whether or not they go on their shelves, just imagine a Fidelity or a Vanguard uh, beginning to do the same thing with uh, providing investment op- op- options to uh, retail investors. Um, and if that, you know, if that becomes the case, then the gatekeeper about, you know, whether you're, whether or not your stock uh, is included in this mutual fund or in this, in this portfolio or in this pension fund, um, is not going to be dedicated, decided by, uh, the, 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 sh- the sort of short-term traders, but these massive, um, institutional, um, investment houses. So I think we're at the beginning, uh, of a, of a long-term sectoral shift. And how exactly it plays out, uh, it can't clearly be mapped out right now. But what's very clear is everybody on this phone conversation is going to be involved in playing a role and experiencing uh, the implications and consequences of that shift. Knut, do you have anything to add to that, or uh, should we move on to the next question? Oh, I think we can move on. I, th- uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a very good answer. Um, well, that, that's absolutely true. The, uh, in, in environments where investors' knowledge about sustainability is still developing or limited, uh, how, do you impress it, how do you impress upon CEOs to embrace sustainability principles? I think that's a good one for Canute. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll get to this and then we... Uh, I think, yeah, listen, I mean... Uh, Expertise, uh, you don't need to have all the expertise in-house, right? You, you just need to be aware that uh, there are consequences of, uh, of uh, their risks, their upsides, etc. There, there is uh, increasingly expertise out there, right? We can uh, hire in, uh, you know, analysts, uh, expertise, etc. to help us on uh, on sustainability issues and and of course, the thing about sustainability it's very broad, right? So it's difficult to have expertise in all the areas uh, under one roof or in 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 one uh, one person. There are labor issues, corruption issues, there are all kinds of uh, environmental issues, etc. So climate change related, etc. So I think uh, you don't need to be an expert. It's like most areas, you have to be aware of the consequence and then pull in expertise. I would say though that uh, we see more as as we see this becoming more important and as we see the consequences being real we also see that the uh, investor uh, investors are building in this uh, uh, expertise in the way they deal with uh, with cases whether it's kind of a portfolio investing or whether it's uh, and we see that for example in private equity whether it's case by case where it's of course more inbuilt into to due diligence processes, etc. But I think the expertise is uh, gradually being being mobilized and being built. Okay, thanks, thanks, Knut. Uh, okay, back to we have another question about uh, uh, business case. Uh, you state that only uh, about 25% of all companies have created a business case or value proof for sustainability. Uh, what is it that uh, those folks are doing uh, that's uh, that's better than others? Well, I think uh, I, I, there's there's no rocket science to this. I think, but as mentioned a couple of times, we're talking about a very broad area, right? So it's uh, it's difficult to kind of nail it down. And and the companies that at least I've seen and we've seen together uh, getting the business case uh, right are companies that are very clear in terms of being, you know, what, what are the material issues? We can't deal with 100 issues. What, what are the ones that really matter for us and where are their, their risks or where are their opportunities? So material issues, that's one. Secondly, uh, you know, we, what is the necessary compliance and how do we address that in a kind of a straightforward way, the way we would deal with uh, compliance in other areas that can be health and safety, etc.? And in which few areas do we want to build competitive advantage where we think that there are you know, underlying opportunities, trends, etc., that makes, and where we have capabilities or at least a willingness to build capabilities that give us that kind of edge over time. So the more specific you are, 
And the more you're able to zoom it in on a few real issues, the easier it is to build the business case. And I think, and, and we see so many successful companies now, they're all able to, to do those three things, you know, define materiality, define what's compliance, agree on where we want to build uh, over time a competitive advantage, grow in new areas, etc. That that would be the advice I have. And, and, and I think it's relatively, once you get started going down, down that route, it becomes relatively straightforward because it becomes more like uh, all the other business cases we do and develop uh, in our strategies and in our business prioritization and planning. Okay. Yeah, D David, I would add to that in that um, uh, he, uh, what Knut said is exactly right. And the, the, the following step is, you know, the, the, the moving towards innovation. And even if it's disruptive innovation for your existing, you know, uh, successful business model. Uh, we didn't necessarily mention this, but we found that companies uh, that reported actually making changes to their business model were more than two times more likely to report that they were generating uh, business value from the sustainability initiatives than others. Um, so that's that's key to it, is um, actually in, um, committing to a sustainability strategy and then innovating uh, sustainability solutions, products or services that meet your customers' need, but do so in a way that address sustainability challenges. And that, that additional step of actually then taking action on sustainability and building it into your uh, your future competitive uh, advantages is really important to actually succeeding on this. Yeah. Uh, so there there have been a couple of questions about access to the content that we've been talking about. Um, the I just wanted to point out that there, right? I hope everybody can see this. Is that uh, there's a link to the report. Uh, that's uh, sloanreview.mit.edu backslash sustainability2016, uh, where you can access the uh, the actual report. Um, and and as I mentioned at the very beginning, and some people may have uh, missed this, uh, we are going to be making available the deck to all participants uh, later. Uh, so we have just a couple minutes left before the end of the uh, presentation. Um, one of the last uh, uh, there, there have been a number of questions about how um, uh, how to get CEOs more uh, active around sustainability, and uh, there's been the question about uh, how do you do that in, a, in an envir in environment in countries where there might ostensibly be uh, uh, other priorities. Um, uh, there. Um, uh, there's a question about sort of how do you do it from within the organization? How do you do it from an investor perspective? Um, Canute, Craig, uh, do you have a 30-second a, a, a uh, uh, point to make about how do you get the attention? And, and it does, of course, depend on who you are and, and you know, where you're communicating from. But um, uh, how, how do you get the senior leadership more engaged around sustainability when it's perceived to be a marginal kind of issue for the organization? Well, this is, Greg, I'll just take a quick shot. I mean, it, it, it's not an easy, simple answer, but there's a, there's a couple things. One thing Knut pointed out is um, a crisis, and usually the crisis, a sustainability uh, crisis uh, in a big cons consumer-facing brand is what gets things started. What happens then afterwards is all of the suppliers to those big consumer-facing brands, um, sustainability moves up very quickly on, on their agenda and gets on the agenda of the CEO as well. So there's something about um, cascading sustainability demands throughout a, a value chain or throughout a, um, a supply chain that's, that can be pretty powerful and drive uh, a lot of this. Um, so it's... Uh, it, it's um, so I, I would say just that perspective. And, and we also see that there's something about competition as well. Um, we've seen industry by industry when, when one major player stands up and decides they're going to differentiate themselves and compete, and compete on sustainability, 
it puts uh, competitive pressure on all the other companies in the industry to come up with a response. And so you have this sort of domino effect. Uh, and you can see this happening as well. And it turns out, um, you know, CEOs and chief executives are quite competitive people, and they're more than willing. Uh, if someone throws down the gauntlet on sustainability, I've seen that. I've seen that motivate a number of uh, of uh, executives um, in many parts of the world. I've I've seen that happen in in Europe. I've seen that happen here in the United States. I've seen it happen in Latin America and Asia. So those are two things. One is if um, you know if the major if the, if your major customer is Greg 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 yes. we're gonna have to cut you cut you off so we can get uh, Canute in for uh, last few seconds uh, before we uh, close close the session. Um, or Canute, do you have anything to add on this question? I I, I agree with George, uh, I I agree with Greg. And the only thing I would add is uh, the more this becomes tangible, the more uh, we will see companies. Uh, driving towards value creation, and, and that's what we really want. We don't want this to be finger pointing or a moral imperative. We want it to be a competitive imperative. I think that's the, what drives innovation and, and value and competitive advantage. You know? Perfect. You're here. That, <laughs> that, that concludes this portion of our program. A reminder that a recording of this program and the presentation slides will be available within three to four business days. Thank you for attending our program today. Thank you, David, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.